Adrian Ann Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Monday, August 8th, 2022 at 5 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting work sessions on National Incident Management System Training and the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for August 8th, 2022. As a reminder to viewers and listeners, due to the nature of tonight's meeting topic, public input is not accepted. However, you may contact the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Kavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Thank you, and I want to announce that the order of the work sessions are going to be switched for tonight. So we're gonna start with the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project, and I'll turn it over to Civil Engineer Darren Muring. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. Um, um, I'm Darren Muring, Civil Engineer. Uh, the goal of the presentation tonight is to uh, present the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project, really to recap how we got to where we are, look at where we are, uh, with, a, with the ultimate goal so that when you go into goal setting or when you consider future budgets, you you're kind of have a lot more information at your disposal as when you make those deliberations. Uh, so that's really the goal tonight. And so just starting off, basic level, we talk about watersheds. Um, What's showing here on the screen is uh, the city limits, and within that, in green, is the B Branch watershed. And in terms of stormwater management, what a watershed is, is just any time it rains, any drop of water that lands within that area, it, if it does run off, will find its way to the same place, which in this case is the B Branch Creek, and then uh, to the 16th Street ponding area, and then ultimately the Piasta Channel. And so, while relatively, you know, about a quarter of the size of the, the city and area, uh, over at least 50% of our citizens either live or work within the Bee Ranch watershed, just to um, kind of outline a, its relative importance to, to our community. Um, just looking a little bit about the hydrology. Um, so most of the runoff generally flows from west to east, to west, down West 32nd Street down Kaufman Avenue or 22nd Street, West Locust and 17th Street, and then some from the northeast on Windsor Avenue down 24th Street, all making its way to the Cooler Valley area where then it migrates to the south to again to the 16th Street ponding area. And all that runoff then exits the watershed into the Piasta Channel through our flood uh, gate system here that was built and originally functioned as part of the flood wall levee system which is finished around 1972. And actually some of the pumps with that station predate that. And so that was our, our starting point. Um, to, it's really hard to capture what goes on a lot of times in the flooding because it happens at night. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of times short duration flash flooding. So we wanted to show you a quick uh, a video here um, to kind of capture what happens when these rainstorms happen. Now granted this is you know, a good 10 years ago but uh, it's a good reminder of why we've been working on this and why it's still important. Street, the water is backed up so bad here at 17th and West Locust. 23 
just for information, I'm blocking off 22nd Jackson. We just came through the same thing you're getting right now. It's rocking and rolling out here. Yeah, we're going to get another one. One of the things unique about Dubuque is, I guess, compared to many other Iowa communities, is that being on the, the Mississippi River, we have you know the bluffs and we have steep terrain, um, and then that drains to flat terrain right next to our uh, river or the Mississippi River, and so. Uh, the water comes very fast, the storm water that does flow off a of property comes very fast off of those steep grades and then slows way down and collects at these lower areas. And that's where we have our problems right now, or the major portion of our problems. 613 now, we have had a very busy night in Dubuque in that area uh, because records have just been shattered with rain. In fact, Nikki Newbro is live for us in Dubuque. Uh, Nikki, tell us about some of the flooding going, going on there. Be, but as you can see, this is a deep area, and this is actually going down, quite honestly. I came out here earlier, you saw that, and it did go down just a little bit, so flash flooding happened so fast. The flooding problems that we have in the north end is that too much water is collecting too fast, mm -hmm. and so it starts to pond up. It can't, it can't find its way into, it, into the storm sewer, so it'll try and it'll just find other ways. It'll, either, it'll actually go into the sanitary sewer or it'll go into people's basements, which okay. is exactly what happened in 7 7's Nikki Newbro is live in Dubuque. Nikki, you saw how flash flooding can just damage a vehicle. Well, that's right. Soon after the rain stopped, we saw people getting out of their homes to assess the damage, and that's when some unlucky car owners just saw how damaging those waters can be. It only took a few minutes, but these Dubuque roads started to look more like rivers early Thursday morning. No. I've seen a little bit of water coming down over there before, but not, not this bad. It's been here almost six years, and we've never seen it this bad. We've never seen it like this. Early this morning, I would have showed you water up to my knees in this street. Now the water's all gone, but people are still trying to figure out what to do, especially if they parked their vehicles on the street. About, well, you can see right where the line was. There. Colleen Klein actually, woke up to standing council, water in her SUV standing this standing morning. In it, so. The whole floor has standing water in it. There's standing water in my center council. And I, my SUV sits pretty high up off the ground. So, But that standing water in Klein's vehicle is now the least of her worries as she tries to get to work today. I, none of my electrical work. It's... Right now, we're kind of sitting at a standstill. But Klein isn't the only one trying to find a ride to work this morning. But I came down here onto Jackson Street, and I didn't realize it was that deep, and I ended up getting stuck in the middle of the highway, or, you know, down the street here. Jody Schoenfeld was just one person of many fooled by how deep the water over the roadway really was. I literally had to crawl out of my vehicle, and there was a kid that kind of helped me crawl out because the water was up to my waist. It was so deep and stuff. Now, most roadways in town are passable. They... Are, you are able to drive through them, but be careful for debris and also those, um, those displaced manhole covers that may have been obviously, like I said, displaced because of the flood.
So again, a lot of those storms are happening in the middle of the night or when it's dark out, so it's really hard to capture what happens. But here was a moderate rainstorm in July of 2016 to, to show this happened right around noontime. Um, and so on the picture on the left is looking up 22nd towards Kaufman Avenue from Central. Um, and then the, and you can just see there's water coming out of the, the manhole. That's what the, that water that's kind of sticking up in the air, shooting up in the air, it's, that's when the, man, the water is coming out of the storm sewer instead of going into it or out of the sanitary sewer going into it, as the case might be. You can see the, the cars like that. It doesn't take much to stall that car to get that on the engine. And then if you look on the picture on the right, uh, that's looking downstream, same, same time. And you might not be able to make out, but there's a person who's just trying to walk across the street at noon. And they actually did get knocked down from the force of the water. They, they weren't hurt or anything, but just, again, to just kind of show the magnitude of what happens in Dubuque. And again, this is in 2016, a little over an inch and a half of rain. But again, within 90 minutes, we have that flash flooding that really is what uh, happens in our community, what makes it difficult for us. Um, again, just a sort of the flashy nature of it. So again, that picture on the left taken 1205, and just 17 minutes later, the water is gone. And you might, you might notice uh, just in, next to that truck there, uh, there is a manhole cover that that's where that water was shooting out. And so you get those dislodged manholes, and of course it's a hazard. Um, for cars when they're traveling to get those put back in place and just it underscores the safety issues in addition to just the flooding. And just you mentioned the video sh talked about the different disasters, but if you look at it, like in 1999, it was only three inches of rain, which to me isn't a lot of rain, but it did happen in only 90 minutes. Um, you know, f about five inches of rain, four inches of rain. So over this 12 year period, we had what statistically, up, at that, up until that point, had been considered one 10-year storm, one 25-year storm, two 50-year storms, and three 100-year storms. Now that's just based statistically on what would we expect. And again, the damage uh, estimates, about $70 million from those rainstorms. And a, and a lot of that damage is, is private damage, so that, so that as a city, we're not even privy to because it, it's between the homeowner, or the auto owner and their insurance company. And so we're not always um, made aware of, of all, the, all the actual damages that take place, but that's why we have to have estimates. Um, the other telling part about when we talk about homes is the, how the property values of these um, homes and businesses had decreased. You know, when you have repeated flooding, you know, every other year or six times in a 12-year period, there's a real disincentive to why would you sink any money into your property or when, when it just happens again and again and again. And this this one indication of what was happening in that flood prone area when you compare it to the rest of the city. Uh, and of course, people were obviously upset. Um, many of them didn't really know, at least in 99, that they were in harm's way when it comes to flooding. Um, you know, and they really were demanding action. They, they wanted us to do something as a city. And at the time we were, had an engineering consultant on board to look at you know, what's happening in the watersheds. And so as we, uh, we build computer models that try to mimic what's happening in the real world, and then once we're fairly satisfied that it matches what we, what we were seeing, we calibrate it, then we can look at, well, what are some of the potential alternatives or solutions to try to mitigate or address that? And that ultimately um, uh, resulted in the 2001 Drainage Basin Master Plan, which outlined a bunch of improvements um, that we'll talk about. Um, but other thing it did is it predicted the flood prone area uh, shown here. That's kind of the Cooler Valley area there in blue. The northern part is West 32nd Street. And the southern part on the bottom right is like the 16th Street Detention Basin at Kerper and obviously the Piazza Channel. And the darker the blue just means that the, the deeper the, the water is predicted in terms of depth. But roughly 1,150 homes and businesses at risk of flooding. A couple of years later, um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency was doing their independent analysis and, and trying to figure out what the floodplain would be in this area. And their floodplain and flood prone area actually included more homes than the ones that, that our study had uh, depicted. But it's just kind of, a, um, kind of a verification or another corroboration of what our models were finding. And then 
you know, we had these, uh, we started doing improvements in 2001 already uh, throughout the watershed, but w through the course of these rainstorms and recognizing that in 2013, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmosphere, Atmos Atmir <laughs> NOAA, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> NOAA came up with their revised um, uh, flood frequency analysis, which really says, okay, this is how much rain we can expect you know, as a 1% chance of this occurring. So they were updating those numbers, having incorporated what had happened over, you know, the last 20 years. And we uh, then took that into consideration and we updated and amended our 2013 drainage basin master plan, which was adopted by the city council. And that was what gave, um, uh, came about was the, the B Branch flood mitigation project plan. And that project plan is, like I said, multi-phase, but it's coming at it three main ways, reducing the volume of stormwater to try to prevent how much actually runs off the landscape, slow the rate and timing so that it doesn't get down to the same plates at the same time, and then once it does get down to flood prone areas, how do we uh, allow it to safely move through our community without causing flooding? And combined, the, the estimated, uh, uh, the project would prevent an estimated $582 million in damage over the life of the project. And so just to kind of touch base on, on where we are with some of these projects, so the Carter Road Detention Basin and West 32nd Street Detention Basin projects were completed over a decade ago. And so right now, we're, it's just routine maintenance. So Carter Road Detention Basin shown here, we really, we mow the embankment that's shown there in the middle of the picture. And then on the right, what's circled in yellow is just our outlets trash rack. So we have to go in there periodically once a year and clean debris from that. Uh, to keep that operating. But other than that, there's, there's no known issues with the Carter Road Detention Basin. Um, West 32nd Street Detention Basin, uh, again, it's just routine maintenance at this point. Um, although th this, that last spring we did um, go in and dredge some of the sediment out of the uh, northern wet, or the westerly wet pond. So historically, if you remember, some of you, there used to be a detention basin here that was built around 1950. And as part of our project, we uh, uh, tri tripled the footprint and doubled the storage capacity. But in the old days, when sediment would wash through the watershed, which sediment, every watershed has a certain amount of sediment that just naturally uh, flows through it along, along within a creek. Um, but it used to spread out over the entire detention basin so that when we removed sediment, it was a pretty big ordeal to dry up the whole thing and you had to uh, excavate all the sediment. Where, where the current design that we have now, uh, there's a wet pond on the westerly side that is designed to capture that sediment, so we only have to remove it in one place. So that was done. We also uh, have done two controlled burns on it, so we planted prairie grass, pollinator habitat, so um, doing a couple of burns in the early life of that project helps establish the prairie grass uh, versus, uh, and then choking out and, and starving out the the invasive uh, plantings. Um, just moving on to the lower and upper B Branch Creek restoration projects. Again, they've been complete for, for some time. Again, routine maintenance. Um, and so one of the things we're, we're dealing with now is just, especially now that we have the railroad culverts project done, is, is you know, how is, is operating it and, and, and maintaining it. So for example, there's some, some sediment that, again, has built up in certain areas within the creek that we're gonna wanna address. And we do have detention basin maintenance money that we will use for that. Um, not a big expense, but just part of, part of the overall maintenance of it. Um, and same thing on the, on the lower B branch. Um, we have done a control burn on the lower B branch as well. And uh, we did have some issues with our floating islands. Uh, so we, this was past year, so we got those um, um, uh, some of them replanted, reestablished. So there's been just minor maintenance on the, on the lower and upper B branch. And, and we've been, had a lot of programming. So now it's just really looking at, uh, looking ahead, um, what do we want to do with these spaces other than what we have right now. But in terms of flood control, there's no known issues or things that need to be addressed on, on these projects in the future. Uh, B branch railroad culverts project, uh, been functional since October of of last year. Uh, again, this is where we had to tunnel um, under the railroad tracks to get the water to flow from the upper 
upstream B branch to the uh, downstream B branch. Um, just to kind of show where, you know, how, where we were and how we, where we are today. So this is 2013 when the lower B branch had been completed, but we still hadn't com started the upper B branch. And then comparing it today, this is an aerial photo looking, so west is Garfield Avenue looking towards the lower B branch. So hardly looks like we did anything. <laughs> <laughs> But, of course, we tunneled the pipes under the railroad tracks, finished that. And then also we added the hike bike trail that goes under the railroad tracks, and it's been open since um, this July. Um, one of the things we like to do is show, you know, when we're, especially of a project this magnitude, is show renderings to help the public uh, and the city council and others understand what we're proposing so that when we go out for bids, we know what we're kind of buying. So this was the rendering that uh, was uh, shown prior to the project. And then this is a photo taken in 2021 um, when it was mostly complete, functional at this point. And the creek project itself, we've increased the flood protection from the 75 year to the 500 year. So if you, you might recall this, probably not, but when we started all of the watershed work, our B branch storm sewer could handle about a five year rainstorm, which is a pretty small rainstorm. And if it exceeded that, it really had nowhere else for that runoff to go. So it would go in streets and people's, people's houses. And when we did the upstream detention basins and did the upper and lower B branch, then we had achieved the 75 year protection. And now, since completion of the uh, railroad culverts, we have the 500 year. And again, that's statistically based on what we would expect to occur, but um, you know, with the rainstorms that have been occurring over the last 10 to 15 years, if that trend continues, um, then we're gonna need the 500 year uh, protection. Um, so what's next? The railroad culverts were, there's still a few punch list items. Some of the landscaping has to be addressed this fall. Some things reseeded, some trees m might not have made it, need to be replanted. But really what we're doing now is just uh, you know, this flood, this flood control, level control gate that you see here, uh, it, it works automatically. Um, it's operated by the uh, um, people from the Water and Research Recovery Center. And so working with them and, and tweaking it, um, because it, what it does is it controls the level of the water in the upstream or the upper B branch. Um, and so we, we want it to be down as often as possible uh, so that fish can find their way up to the, the, B, the north end neighborhood for uh, for sport, um, but at the same time, it's, it's there to pre prevent uh, the water from backing up into that area and killing landscaping, so we really can control the level of the, the water. And so that'll be a kind of a work in progress, tweaking that to figure out what where's the best range for that. Moving on to the 22nd and Kaufman storm sewer capacity improvements. Um, so just again, to recap, this was done over several phases. Um, completed the first section in 2018, uh, up from the B branch through Central Avenue. Uh, and then in 2020, completed the, the next section. Later in 2020, uh, up through North Main, probably finished up in early 2021. Um, and then, and then what, what kind of progress did we make? So again, this is that rainstorm I showed uh, earlier, July of 2016, before we had completed uh, those improvements. And the photo on the right was just a couple weeks ago, actually very similar rain, uh, two, a little more than two inches of rain in 90 minutes. And you can see there isn't any storm water coming out of the storm sewer. The manhole lid isn't blowing off the um, storm sewer there. So uh, that, that's some improvements realized. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't have any video or photos upstream of there. Um, um, like north of North Main, or I'm sorry, west of North Main, there's still gonna be issues on the street where the water would be able to uh, flood and exceed the curb depth and eventually spill out into private property. So um, the reason why it's looking good here is we've got those grates going all the way across the street, so anything above is getting sucked up by that, but um, north of here, we, or west of there, we still have some work to do. And so as, as it outlines here, we've, you know, have this uh, additional uh, project we'd like to do to get the improvements to Hempstead and then eventually to Kane Street. And so these, are, these improvements have been designed 
and our, what we call kind of their shovel ready. Now this could be done as part of a, you know, back several years ago we used to do street reconstruction project, well like we're doing at Stoneman Road. So it could be something like that, you know, down the road. Um, if, or it could be a combination of that and maybe some, <coughs> or some other funding source. So um, just something we want to work towards and continue to strive to complete. Moving on to the 17th Street and West Locust. <clears throat> so a very similar situation, we're looking to increase the capacity. You know, once we have the B Branch Creek in place, now we have a place for that stormwater to go and we can make these improvements to get the stormwater off the street. So we completed the first section through Elm Street, 2018, uh, the green section, 2020. Uh, a short extension in 2020. Right now we've been working on the design and getting um, the approvals in place with the, with the railroad to tunnel again under this section of the pipe to increase the conveyance through the railroad property. Uh, that should be uh, done here in the next few months. So generally speaking, we've got again about 27 and a half million dollars in shovel ready projects. Um, and the other thing about this project I should point out is that it's not just storm, storm sewer, storm water management. You know, when we go from Elm all the way to Rosedale Avenue, it's all, all new water main, it's all new sanitary sewer, new uh, um, private laterals and, and private water, water mains. <clears throat> Um, so that's what makes up this project. And again, this is showing video uh, on West Locust Street, and you can see we, we still do have some work to do here. Um, the one issue with 17th and West Locust is because of where existing utilities are, we, we can extend it so far up 17th Street, you know, take off bite-sized chunks, but once we get into West Locust, then we got to rework a lot of existing utilities. So then you really have to go a certain distance, but just um, something we can plan for if we, depending on the funding. Uh, B Branch Healthy Homes, I, I know that um, Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger presented this information you know, recently, but just to recap, you know, we were awarded that almost $9 million and over a six year period, we were able to work on 307 housing units. You can see kind of the breakdown there of of you know, 114 single family units all the way down to 130 unit apartment complex. And just a, you know, one example, this is 2015, 2017 Knee Street, kind of showing the new elevated water heater and furnace, the new electrical services. You know, most times these would get flooded. And if you're, <clears throat> well, if you're like me, you can't really afford to replace this every other year. So um, a lot of people would just let it go, dry it out, but then you've really got the chance of corroded wires and potential electrical hazards if you don't address them. But to really tell the story um, of, of the success of this program, I, I can't do it any better than, than uh, North End resident and uh, Cletus Cashman. I get up at all hours, one, two, three, four, five, let it stay down there until I got it under control and it, you know. I'm a stubborn old Irishman. <laughs> and a Marine. I never give up on anything. We out there that time, it was to rain like there. It was just like a lake. There was just so much water all gathered here, here. It was in, uh, incredible. The story goes that he actually saw his neighbor with a boat next door on a couple of occasions. And as he was raising six kids, he was often downstairs at one, two, three o'clock in the morning, catching that water that was coming in to try to save his belongings and save his home. These are stories that we hear every day. And we knew that he was the right fit for our program just based on the experiences that he had had. We were able to install some concrete on both sides of the houses near the foundation to shed water away from the house. 
If water made it into the house, we install the sump pump so that the water can get to it and then again be pumped out as needed. The furnace and water heater had had extensive damage over the years, so we were able to install new ones. Um, the gutters and downspouts on this house were smaller than the average size, so we were able to right size those and also take them to the street instead of the backyard that really has no way to drain the water. Well, this is God's, you know. I wish this happened 30, 40 years ago. It'd be nice. Well, my wife could enjoy it, too. Excuse <clears throat> me. Yeah. But I'm glad everything come up with the city now. This is going to be good for the future. The, the, anybody in the North End, they're going to fix a lot of these homes up. Here. They're all good homes here. But you nobody know, would have to put any money into it, and you couldn't blame them for the simple fact. The water would ruin everything. It was not. It was just fight, fighting it. You couldn't do it. But like I said, now you, you can get things fixed up and take things down in the basement. You know, then you go get it flooded out. Oh, you would know that it was sometimes something miserable. Lost a lot of stuff here over the years. That was still here. Cletus has a great story. He's been in this community his entire life. He's a war veteran. He worked since he was 15 years old and was able to raise six children in that home uh, all along the way with some flash flooding. He's absolutely the person that we aim to help in this community and we've been honored to be part of that process and give him the peace of mind at the age of 90 that he's probably been looking for for a very long time. It's going to help the North End future long after I'm gone. It's going to be a lot better. Yeah, a lot better. <laughs> so, very, very impactful program. Just to recap a little bit. So, over the period of the program, we received 650, well, I should say 57 and 657 applications were requested. They weren't all returned. And of course, we stopped advertising last fall because we had already approved you know, what we were gonna be able to accomplish with the money we had. Um, of the 357 applications reviewed, 42 of them were ineligible due to either location or their income. Um, but 315 were approved. So if you compare that, we had 307 we were able to do. That means that eight were actually approved, but we didn't have any money for them to uh, work on their homes. And then we've got, you know, 34 applications that we just didn't review because the money was exhausted. So um, the other part of the, that was also the home adv advocacy, um, home visitation to kind of, in addition to the flooding issues and, and the actual infrastructure of their home, what, what other family issues might they be having um, to try and understand, you know, what would make, again, this is a, a resiliency project, so what, what can we do to make the, a family more resilient to be able to handle something like a, a flooded basement? And over, you know, having worked with uh, 306 of those families, 307 of those families, this is kind of where those um, needs were categorized or buckets again. And of course, the, um, you know, the benefit of the advocacy is that you've got a uh, person going in there and if they have an issue, a family has an issue, then you have got another person who is aware of programs that might be able to assist with whatever that, that issue might be. And so what's next? Um, again, I mentioned there's eight families that qualify but were unable to receive assistance and another 35 could possibly qualify. So uh, it might be something we pursue in the future as far as um, healthy homes. Um, the home advocacy program, it's my understanding, it's still uh, taking place, but it's under a, a new grant program to, to, to some extent. But that current grant itself, you know, is, is limited funding. So it's something we're looking to, con to continue. Uh, moving on to the flood mitigation gate and pump replacement project. 
so this project, again, is down on Kerper Boulevard. This is a picture of the pump station that's been in place since 1970, around that time frame. Again, the pumps themselves predate that. Um, but really, when the river comes up, we close the floodgate, and every, all stormwater then has to be pumped from the Bee Branch watershed into the Piasta Channel. And this is just a closer look again at the um, station. So that uh, the structure on the left is the kind of the gates, uh, the, the tubular circular uh, thing coming out of the middle. That those are the two pumps. And then there's a generator there on the on the right side. But our, our idea was to replace that um, and actually build it on the on the ponding side or the city side of the levee system. And you know it's going to ring, it was to increase resiliency by handling the floodwaters again from that 500-year level for protection, um, provide flexible gate operation, you know update all electrical and, and facilities that have been there for you know 50 years. Um, and we did have we do have 2.5 million dollars uh, of a EDA grant that was to help us fund that, and so we had 12.1 million dollars, and that was at our anticipated project cost. Um, but when we received bids, they came in over 50% over the project estimate. Um, one of the main reasons for that is, if you look at the image here, you, you just see a lot of, this is also extending below the water, but it's a lot of concrete there, a lot of steel, a lot of structural um, um, reinforced construction. So just as an example, in two months, the price of steel went up by 18% in this in this this spring and concrete was not quite as drastic but similar and so you know when we started designing this project you know four years ago you know didn't anticipate the price of steel and concrete going up so high if we had the footprint probably would have been smaller probably would have been a little more economical with the size but um, that's the situation we found ourselves um, and so one of the things right now is we've been communicating with, with EDA to see how we can proceed and still utilize their grant funding. Um, they're, per the agreement, we're supposed to spend the money, have everything done by April of 2024, which you think, hey, that's om almost two years from now. But this, a project of this nature really takes a couple of years to construct. Uh, and so we, we wouldn't be able to um, redesign anything. Uh, and, and build it within that time frame. And so one of the things we're looking at doing uh, would be potentially building a, a new pump station, you know, say 200 feet to the west, or to, I should say to the north or to the left on the screen, leave the existing pump station in place so we could then double the capacity but not have all the expenses up front. And then maybe 10 years later, we then add the, to, the, to the new facility and then we could decommission the old one, kind of phase out the old one instead of try to get rid of it all at once. Um, for example, we were going to put the four new pumps in. Each pump was over a million dollars of that cost. So um, just doing that right there would save $2 million off, off the top. So that's kind of what we're looking at and how we're working with EDA um, to, to see about doing that. Um, flood mitigation maintenance facility. So this is the property that's uh, we refer to as a Bloom property. It was it was a recycling metal recycling facility operated by Al Al Bloom for many years, and so the council purchased this property for these reasons stated on here: a maintenance facility, public parking, public restrooms, some green space, uh, and then at some point an overlook as part of the America's River Three uh, commitment from the Depaco. And so East Bloom. Um, we've been working on that and cleaning that up. That's been done for probably a year now. Um, we've gone through that process, so that's that's ready for us to do what we want with it. We we left the the green metal pole building there to just in the meantime to try to uh, get by, but ultimately that's where our green space. We want to go next to that public space. On the West Bloom. We're still working on the cleanup there. We've been working with the, with, the, with the EPA on getting a cleanup plan approved. We hope to go out for bid very soon and then for that work to, to be completed this fall. Just a, a look. And so that's really going to take care of, there's still some environmental issues inside the building on the right there. They're the 15th Street building. 
uh, and then taking care of stuff that's on the grounds itself. So there is a, an old um, shear that they used to uh, basically compact metal and part of that had leaked out over the years and so there's contaminants in the soil around that um, as well as other parts in the top like six to 12 inches of that property. So we're gonna be doing the cleanup on that and get it ready for development. Um, and then, you know, what's next? So uh, we, we do have funding to kind of look at a preliminary design of a restroom storm shelter for possibly to, to uh, have some funding through FEMA or a brick grant for um, on the property. Um, it's also gonna be considered as part of the park master plan in the next few months to see, see how this property might be used in conjunction with other public spaces, public um, parks. Um, and so that's gonna be taking place. And the North End Storm Sewer Capacity Improvements, and this is really just improving the storm sewers in the kind of the cooler valley, North End, you know, in the event that this does flood in the future, uh, so that it can drain efficiently away now that we have the capacity in the B branch. And so this is just something that we would look to um, doing the design on and then over, over the next several years um, reconstructing these. And they'd be better done if they're done in conjunction with maybe like an overlay project or a street reconstruction project or water main replacement project. So we'll try to schedule, we try to schedule those when that, when those can all be done at the same time to really get uh, cost, cost savings or you get efficiencies there. Uh, the next one is the water plant flood protection. Um, again, this is really to uh, provide some sort of secondary containment system so that in the event that we do have a, uh, a super flood that our levy doesn't handle or, or we, for whatever reason, there's a, a, a breach in the levy system that our our, our only, you know, uh, water supply um, plant would, would remain in operation and functional for the community. And then the last one is just the, the green alleys and pervious service reduction. And we've been working on, on these. We've completed about 81 uh, to date, and we are working on the design of a few right now. Um, the main issue with this is, you know, we use $9.4 million in the SRF sponsorship funding to do about 73 or 74 of these alleys. And, and so now it's just finding, you know, continuing to continue that progress where we do a few alleys every year. Um, one of the things that we continue to do, like we have money right now through the sponsorship program. So that's one of the things we look to do if, if we're going to say, um, like if we have, well, like the Old Mill Road uh, lift station project, if that's a $20 million project, we could potentially get a $2 million in sponsorship funding from that that we could then potentially use for green alleys. And so that would go, that'd go a long way to doing some more alleys. Um, just a recap on costs, and a lot of these are estimates just because um, they're a work in progress. But it does show you know, we have been very fortunate to secure 100, over $165 million in, in outside funding assistance. And so our share is about a little over 85 million uh, of the entire project cost. And just to, again, give credit where credit is due, um, thanks to a lot of the work that um, Terry Goodman does in her office in fostering these partnerships um, with, out, with, with state and federal agencies and, and local, local partners, um, you know, this wouldn't have been a reality. And of course, the, the citizens of Dubuque, um, you know, for their contribution in making this a reality. It's, um, I just wanna point out their, you know, credit for, uh, for getting us where we are today. And with that, I'll just open up for any questions or comments or. All right. Thank you very much, Darren. That was a, a very, very thorough and very helpful overview of where we've been and, and where we're going. So I really appreciate that. All right. Questions? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Resnick. Yes. First of all, I'm down there three or four times a week. Love the love the area. It's uh, it's it's far more than just you know a, a place to escort the water out of town and uh, it's a it's a great place and it draws a lot of people and a lot of people from the neighborhood and from all over the city it's a great meeting place 
So uh, I know that was all part of the plan as well. I know this is, you're talking about the business side here, get that water moving. But um, so many wonderful things are happening. Uh, so, uh, you know, wow, it's fantastic. A couple quick questions. We had some problems in the 30 street, 32nd Street LJ uh, blooms. There was some remediation. Could you tell me, is that uh, still uh, behaving itself there? So yeah, the 32nd Street Detention Basin, especially in that westerly pond, it was covered with a, a green growth. Um, at least in the past, it was actually duckweed, which, I mean, quite frankly to me, anything green in the water, I would call algae, but having been educated a little bit on this one, duckweed actually is growing on the surface. And it really, it'll probably continue to be an issue and we'll have to deal with it in the future because that, that usually, forms where there's not a lot of wind movement or wave action and that's tucked in there and it's surrounded by trees and so it's actually a sign of healthy water because it, it can grow on top but um, yeah it's something we're definitely gonna have to monitor and watch um, going forward and we might just have to skim it off every once in a while I don't think it's gonna be a major expense but yeah just something to watch for sure duckweed duckweed that's yeah. a new one for me <laughs> uh, the other thing is uh, when we when we're down there um, in the Greenway, uh, right along there, so there's a lot of plants in that water. Is that normal? Is it overcrowding? Or is, you know, I see some fish down there, but a lot of it is plants. Is, is that uh, intentional? So that's all volunteer. It's just grown where it will. And it, and it will change depending on, you know, if we, how long it is between rainstorms. Some of it will, um, you know, wash away. Um, We've been working with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and, their, and a person from their fisheries department to really look at our creek and see what, you know, as we look at what maintenance we should be doing inside the creek. So sediment's one thing we're looking at. The amount of, of growth in there, you know, is that something we should be dealing with or not? So it, it, it's voluntary, it's natural. Um, it's just a matter of, again, how we're gonna maintain it. Uh, we gotta continue to ask those questions um, right now, I, my, from my knowledge right now, it's not an issue, um, but it's just a matter of, as we continue to look at the creek, now that it's fully functional, tweaking that to, to meet what we, what we want. Uh, thank you. The Bee Branch Flood Mitigation Project, it reminds me of that, um, that saying, the best things in life are free, but the second best things in life are very, very expensive. <laughs> and, and I think this is you know, right up there. So congratulations. Thanks for the information. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Farber. So speaking of expenses, um, could you give me a little bit of the uh, the history of the um, outstanding 85 million that is the city obligation? Is that past, current, future? Is it built out over the next 10 years? So that is mainly what we've expended to date or, or debt we're currently retiring. The 85 million? The 85 million. Yeah. Okay, so projecting for the next 10 years, do you have also figures for us? Um, hey, Darren, could you go back to that last oh, sure. slide that shows all the different components and okay. your costs? Yeah. So, yeah, the, the 85 million would be, is I don't have the exact figure no of worries. what we've spent to date. Um, you know, some of that 85 million would be in, for example, the impervious surface reduction. Now, I remember we spent, that 57 million right there includes the 9.4 that we've already spent that we got. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a breakdown of what's, you know, of all the products. That's why the two asterisks, you know, they're estimated because we've, we've partially done some work on them, but they're not done. Okay, so so I, I can certainly provide what we've spent. Okay, so I spent assume today. you won't be shy when we come to budgeting next year as to what it would cost. And I think that the blooms are, uh, still very pleased that you know we're working with that property also, which I think is a major potential contribution uh, yeah. for the clean, for the sustainability too. So, okay, I'll I mean, look forward I to the numbers. I think in round numbers we've got about what about 110 million dollars of projects left yeah. to do, and uh, of course we've got the nine dollars uh, stormwater fee, which for somebody bigger than a house is a lot bigger than $9 because it's based on your impermeable surface. Right. Um, and then we still are receiving the grant proceeds from the state of Iowa sales tax increment. Mm -hmm. So as, as you, can you go to the one that shows the dates on it, the years? Thanks. 
Thank you. So you can see we, those dollars will be coming in through 2040. Mm -hmm. um, so we've still got you know what, almost 20 years of revenues that will be coming in to fund that $110 million in improvements. Yeah. And uh, we do anticipate some increases in that $9 uh, stormwater fee mm -hmm. along the way. As a matter of fact, there's already one program for next year, I think, isn't it goes to yeah, we'll talk about it, yeah. nine something next year in next budget year. Um, so right now, those are our funding sources. And then Darren mentioned this idea of we can get these uh, additional grants uh, from the DNR off of the projects like at the storm uh, or the water and resource recovery center or when we do uh, uh, sanitary sewer projects. Um, so yeah, we are not gonna be bashful about asking to get some of these things done. Um, and the, the not bashful part will come from the idea of increasing that stormwater fee mm -hmm. and applying for grants, federal and state grants, or funding sources, some that are just low interest loans, and either the repayment stream for those loans or the match for the grants. Okay, so it sounds like a very prudent way to step into and to ladder into the, um, the payments. So I appreciate that. So thank you very much. And I'll look forward to hearing more. And it's a great project. So thank you. Thanks. I'll add to that point real quick, too, I think, before I open more questions. You know, I think it, it also speaks to the importance of the advocacy work that we're doing with our federal contingent and, and any state contingent that we can. I mean, you know, you mentioned Terry Goodman's office and the director of strategic partnerships there, but um, that's work that we can all be doing as well. I mean, any time that we are talking to people who are our elected officials at the next levels, uh, it's important that we talk about projects like this that we know are going to be, that are still on the radar, going to remain on the radar until 2040 and beyond. So that's another piece of that too, I think. Thank Other you. questions? Yeah, Ms. Weffel. Um, so I grew up in a more rural uh, river town, and we didn't call it duckweed. We called it duck butter. What was it? Duck, duck butter. Ah, OK. Called it that with my son last week down at the River Museum. And I thought, oh, I haven't said duck butter in a long time. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about if we decided to do, for instance, one of two smaller pumping stations, each with two pumps, would we be able to still get the EDA money? Is the timeline? such that we could design it and do it? Yeah, well, we would have to ask for an extension to, to their, we have to get beyond spring of 2024. What we, the, what we would achieve by doing the smaller one beside it and keeping the existing one is we would provide the benefit that we were with the bigger project with, us, with the smaller one. So we'd still get the benefits that they were hoping to make a reality. And so that's, but we would, we would need more time. We would have to, you know, design those improvements and work with the Corps of Engineers to permit it. And so there would be some time for that. But yeah, we'd need an extension from them, so. But in essence, then we could do the larger project as almost a more staged project. Yep. It really is too separate. Yeah. Okay. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then how do we prioritize where we do green alleys first? So um, I'm sure we all get contacts about people would love to have their alleys redone because everybody would love to have their alleys redone. Um, but the, the first, what was it, $9 million that we got through this, this program where we were, when we did the Water and Resource Recovery Center for $70 million, they allowed us to use our interest payments for other projects in the city, and that, en that equaled $9 million. And the way we prioritize those first in round number 75 alleys, so there's what, 240 total? The first 75 was the ones that did not have water and sewer under them. So then they weren't gonna burden our water fund or our sewer fund, uh, and, and that was our first priority. And, and then it became basically a flood priority. So I, I can give you a recent example uh, we've got on one alley where we have a, a collapsed retaining wall that we're responsible for as the city. So the engineering department was, well, when we're replacing this retaining wall, it only makes sense that we do the alley. Now, I haven't agreed with that logic yet. We're still analyzing because we have money right now for two or three yeah. uh, alleys that we can still do. So we're still trying to figure out which two or three those will be. And we've already done all the 
cheap ones, the ones that don't have water and sewer. So now we've got to figure that out. And so I don't know if you want to give any kind of broader perspective than that, Darren. Yeah, that's generally how we do it. We try to, you know, like center place is a, there's a, a sanitary sewer just off of Alta Vista that again is a sanitary sewer project. And so the idea would, well, it might be, might make sense to redo that alley at the same time. So that's just kind of one of the ways, like, like he's saying that we do try to prioritize, but otherwise there's no grand scheme necessarily. Mr. Spring. Uh, Darren, though, and Mike, you, but if you could convince all your neighbors to wanting a green alley, you could speed, you could speed up the process some. Is that correct? I always thought well, that you can speed it up a lot because that program is the, the neighbors pay 100% of the cost and we just assess them. Yes. We do it. It gets assessed to their property taxes and they get done. But I can give you a little historical context. I'll try not to be too boring. That's all right. Um, but, you know, when we started this whole B branch idea, there was nothing in there about the alleys. And um, we always get complaints about alleys, always. And uh, so we started talking about this idea of we could make that part of the B branch project because it would, it would uh, drain stormwater off instead of shedding it off into people's yards and basements, it would drain it down through these permeable alleys. And so the state had this program for three years, by the way, at that time, this had to be 10 years ago now, where when you did a project like a sewer plant or a, store, a sanitary sewer project, you could use the interest to pay for something else that dealt with clean water. And in three years, not one city had, been, had a successful application. So we, <laughs> got a whole bunch of brains together, including, uh, Kren, I don't know, were you here? I think you were here then. I think you were one of the brains. You might have been an intern then, actually. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously Terry Goodman and the engineering staff, and we have a law firm in Des Moines. And we met with the DNR and the uh, Iowa Finance Authority an unbelievable amount of times and helped them <laughs> figure out you got this program that nobody's ever eligible for. Let's get to yes. And so we were the first city in the state to get one of those grants. And it was about $9 million. And that was what we told them we would direct it towards was our, our alleys and turn them into green alleys, which they considered a water quality project. And once we got that grant, now cities get them all the time. <laughs> And it's, you know, we opened the floodgates, excuse, excuse the pun. Um, but, you know, that, that's, we, we knew that someday something had to happen with alleys because every time somebody called, that's exactly what we told them. You get all your neighbors together, we'll assess you 100% of the costs, and we'll replace your alley. You know how many we did? Zero. No. The other thing is thank you for everything you guys have done. I mean, this has been monumental in my neighborhood, even my own home. When you've mentioned some of the floods, it's like, oh, yeah, the previous land, the previous owner had writ on, wrote on the ceiling how high the water was in the basement in 93. It's like, this is how high it was. Oh, okay. So I get it. So, But it, we we can't express enough of how well this has happened. And, and you see it every time it rains. Oh, nobody has problems anymore. You just, people are happy. Um, we know there's a long way to go and hopefully, yes, we have to keep remembering the funds and keep working on it. So thank you. Any others? No? All right. Well, thank you so much, Darren, for the, for the updates and, um, and to everyone who's worked on this project over the years. It's just about everybody in, in the city of Dubuque, really, when it comes down to it. Um, but I think it's important to note that uh, we're, we're not done yet, and we, we definitely want to continue on making the improvements that need to be made. You showed pictures of you know, the, the situation on West Locust, and uh, neighbors are clearly aware of that situation there. And I think it's important that everybody else in Dubuque recognize that that's still their situation. 
so that we can make sure that we continue to push for this. And know that we're doing everything that we can, so it's not just um, you know, using property taxes to be able to pay for this, it's also making sure that we're getting the funding that we can. We've been very creative up to this point, and I, I know that we're gonna continue to do that and continue to work towards that. So thank you very much. So there being no further business, we're adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.